A man, completely at random, attacks another man sitting next to him on the bus, unprovoked, and moves on to consume parts of him, all in front of a stunned crowd. How and why could this even happen? I just want to take a minute to talk about the sponsor of today's video, Indel. Indel is a soundscape app backed by neuroscience patented technology that creates personalized audio experiences. It generates sounds that are designed to help your performance or to even just help you relax and focus. Let's say that you're suffering from stress and anxiety and you're having a little bit of trouble being productive. Indel can help calm your mind to create feelings of comfort and security. Indel can even boost your performance by helping you concentrate for long periods of time, helping you to really get into that flow state and shut out all that other noise. Maybe you're having trouble sleeping, or you're feeling tired, or your sleeping quality just isn't good enough. Easy. Just head over to the sleep section and find a soundscape that really clicks with you. Or maybe in the end, you really just need help finding that mental clarity to be more productive or creative. Indel can definitely back you up on that one. You can even bring up more specific scenarios and generate sounds helpful for those certain situations, like reading, doing chores, working out, studying, and more. I'm the kind of person who always has to have some kind of noise playing in the background, whether it's music, or a podcast, or some show I've seen a million times, or even just an air conditioner. Indel really helps scratch that itch for me. It always has just the right sort of sound for just the right vibe. It's really easy to open up, get right to the point, and get listening and I think you'll be impressed with the results. The first 100 people to download Indel by clicking the link in the description below will get a free week of audio experiences, so go ahead and check it out, you got nothing to lose. Timothy Richard McLean Jr. was a man who was living his best life. Born in 1985 in Manitoba, he was 22 years old at the time of today's incident. Tim, as everyone called him, was working as a carnival worker in Alberta, more specifically a carnival barker, which was honestly something I had to look up. I guess that's the guy who tries to gain the attention of passerbys and get them to come to the carnival, like a hype man. He was just doing his best to bring in the money and support his child. He would travel around a lot with his work. In the summer of 2008, he hopped on a Greyhound bus headed towards Winnipeg on the Yellow Highway. Hoping to kind of get some peace and quiet and just sleep the trip away, he headed to the back of the bus. He put on his headphones, got comfortable, and tried to drown it all out and just get some rest. But that was when another man got onto the bus as well, a man named Vince Lee. Vince Lee was an immigrant to Canada from China. He graduated from the Wuhan Institute of Technology in the early 90s with a degree in computing. Not a bad degree to have. After working in that field for a while, he gave it all up and moved to Canada in 2001, becoming a citizen in 2006. It seems that he felt more or less completely Canadian at this point, going by a more traditional name you'd find in an English country and speaking mainly only English. However, not all was good with Vince. Not at all. In 2004, he was actually hospitalized after what has been vaguely called a run-in with the Ontario Provincial Police. He stopped working in his field of computing and his jobs became more erratic. In 2006, he abruptly left his wife back alone at home in Winnipeg and moved to Edmonton, although she later went out and joined him. He worked at Walmart for a while until he was fired after a, quote, disagreement with some of the other employees. Then he worked at some fast food restaurants and finally started delivering newspapers. Both his mental health and his career were in a downward spiral. He was not doing well, but he himself didn't realize that. To add to that, to others, he appeared very normal, even being called reliable, hardworking, dependable, and free of trouble. That was going to change. Tired of delivering papers, he decided to hop on a bus to Winnipeg and take a job interview over there. Although he appeared normal to those around him, the thoughts in his head were very different. I began to hear voices that normal people do not hear. I thought I heard the voice of God telling me to write down my journey. The voice told me that I was the third story of the Bible. That I was like the second coming of Jesus. I was to save people from a space alien attack. That is why I traveled around the country. I'm not sure of all the places I went to. At around noon on July 28, 2008, Vince boarded the Greyhound bus headed for Winnipeg. He was on there for over a day when, the next day at 6pm, he got off in Erickson, Manitoba, with three bags. 
For unknown reasons, he decided to sleep on a bench near a grocery store for the night. However, witnesses said he wasn't sleeping. In fact, he was seen at 3 a.m. sitting straight up, stiff, with his eyes wide open. The next morning, he sold his brand new laptop to a random 15-year-old boy he saw for only $60. Then, when the next bus came by, he got on. Passengers saw the tall man with a buzz cut and dark sunglasses moving down the aisle. He sat down toward the front of the bus, but as the bus moved on and came to a rest stop, he moved back toward the back of the bus and sat down next to Tim McLean. Vince sat down next to Tim, smiled, and asked, How are you doing? seeming friendly enough. Little did everyone know, he was hearing the voice of God in his head. That voice told him, Kill the man, or die immediately. Tim, likely half asleep, barely gave Vince a word in return before he put his headphones back on and leaned back against the window. The bus began to move and all seemed normal. Tim was sleeping quietly with his head leaned up against the window, uh, not really anything going on. But suddenly Vince pulled a large knife out of his bag. He then started to stab Tim rapidly all over his chest and his neck. The bus naturally flew into a panic, and the driver pulled along the side of the highway and stopped the vehicle. Witnesses said that Vince was oddly emotionless and oblivious to everyone around him while attacking. They were shocked by how calm he really was. There was no rage or anything. He was like a robot stabbing the guy, said one of the passengers. Vince himself later said, I was really scared. I remember cutting off his head. I believed he was an alien. The voices told me to kill him, that he would kill me or others. The bus driver and a few brave passengers helped to rush all of the other passengers out of the bus. The driver and two of the passengers tried to save Tim, but Vince chased them away with the knife whenever they got close. Uh, I told everybody to get off the bus, everybody started to get off the bus. Uh, the guy step, kill step, or still kept stabbing him, stabbing him. Uh, everybody got off the bus. Me and a trucker that had stopped and the Greyhound driver uh, ran up to the door to, to maybe see if the, the guy was still alive or we could help or something like that. And when we all got up, we seen that the guy was cutting off the guy's head. Uh, he was cutting off the guy's head there. And he saw us. He, he came back to the front of the bus, told the driver to shut the door. Uh, he pressed the button and the door shut, but it didn't shut in time, and the guy was able to get his knife out and take a swipe at us, so we backed off the door, and uh, I ran around the back side of the bus, the bus driver took off, and then we both returned to the front to see what had happened, and he, he hadn't gotten, gotten off the bus, the door was still open. Uh, we shut the bus door that time and shut it. Being a narrow bus, there wasn't really much of a way to get around him or ambush him from any other side. The driver immobilized the bus so that it couldn't be taken over, and they hopped out, locking the doors behind them. Vince never stopped stabbing and cutting, eventually moving on to removing Tim's head completely. He then stood up, walked over to the windows, and held up the head for everyone standing outside of the bus to see. Uh, it was at that point that he came, he started walking to the front of the bus, and he had a, the, the head in his hand, and he just looked at us like this and, and dropped it on the ground. But totally calm. Um. Many of them went into shock at this point. Some even started throwing up on the spot. Then Vince returned to the body, and this is when he began to savagely consume parts of it. Shortly after the attack began, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in Porage la Prairie received a report that a man had been stabbed on a bus just west of the city. 40 Alpha 8. Badger is armed with a knife and a pair of scissors, and he's defiling the body at the front of the bus as we speak. They took off down the highway and shortly came across the bus. They were not prepared for what they were about to see. They saw that the attacker was still on board with the victim, locked in as everyone else stood outside in shock and disbelief. A passenger and the driver were standing outside the bus, armed with a crowbar and a hammer ready to attack him if he got out. The three of us had uh, weapons from the, the, truck, the trucker's truck there, and we just stayed outside while he tried to get out the door, uh, telling him, oh, stay put, stay put, stay there, don't, don't try to come out. Uh, it was at that point, I think, that the police showed up and uh, kicked, us off, 
got us to the back, the end of the bus there. Uh, some people were puking, some people were uh, crying, some people were in shock. Um, were people running when they screaming? Yeah, everybody was running, screaming off the bus. All of the other passengers were huddled together on the side of the road, most in shock, but some were sobbing and vomiting. It was now 9 p.m. and the RCMP had called in some negotiators to help deal with the problem. Vince tried to escape by driving the bus, not knowing that it had been disabled. He was left with nowhere to run. Vince was still on the bus, locked in, but armed and visibly very insane. He was pacing back and forth and then started to eat more of the body as the police looked on in horror. While transporting the stranded passengers away from the scene, Vince shouted out, I have to stay on this bus forever. The standoff lasted all the way up until 1.30 a.m. This was when Vince decided that he'd get off the bus and make a break for it by busting a window and hopping out. He shattered one of the windows, then threw his knife and a pair of scissors out ahead of him. Then he jumped out himself. The RCMP jumped on him and arrested him soon after. In the scuffle, he was tased twice. Soon enough, he was in handcuffs, thrown into the back of a police car. Tim's body was then retrieved from the bus, or at least most of it was. His ear, nose, and tongue were found in Vince's pockets. His eyes and his heart were never found. It was assumed that Vince completely devoured them. The bus was now an active crime scene, so there was no going back to it. At 10 a.m. the next morning, Greyhound representatives took the remaining passengers from the bus to go buy some clothes to replace what they had left behind on the bus. They safely arrived in Winnipeg that day around 3 p.m., likely traumatized for life. Within a week of the incident, Greyhound Canada had to pull a lot of new nationwide advertisements that they had released, which used the slogan, there's a reason you've never heard of bus rage. It, uh, didn't seem to be in the best taste anymore. The incident also led to a surge of public outcry demanding stricter security on buses. All was quiet when it came to Vince Lee himself for a while. He was charged with second-degree murder and appeared in court, although very briefly, where the only words he spoke out loud were, Please kill me. He refused legal help. However, he was forced to undergo a psychiatric examination. Then, five months after the attack in December, Tim McLean's new son was born, fated to never meet his father. Fast forward a year to 2009. Vince Lee's trial finally started in March. He pled not guilty due to being not criminally responsible due to a severe mental disorder, meaning that he does agree that the incident did occur, but he didn't meet the mental standards to understand the gravity of what he was doing. The psychiatrist who performed his examination stated that he performed the attack because he believed to be hearing the voice of God. The voice told him, Destroy the demon sitting behind you, or you will be killed yourself. The judge presiding over the case accepted the diagnosis and agreed that Vince was not criminally responsible for the murder. He had a very nasty case of untreated schizophrenia, which he did not know at the time. He may have been mentally incapable of even realizing that there was a problem. Vince was then taken away to Selkirk Mental Health Center. It wasn't long before Vince started to be allowed supervised walks outside the facility. It was only about a year, in fact. After that supervised attention outside of the facility for about another year, in May of 2011, his doctors and psychiatrists decided that he was responding pretty well to his medication. They recommended that he gradually receive more freedoms over the coming months. One more year passed and Vince started to gain temporary passes that would allow him to leave the health center and go into town, supervised by a nurse and a peace officer. It was around this time that he spoke out for the first time about the attacks, saying that, at the time, he believed the voice of God was telling him to help save people from an alien attack. He believed that Tim was one of those aliens. Then, two years later, in 2014, Vince started to be allowed to go out completely on his own on unsupervised trips to town, first starting at 30 minutes and then gradually increasing to full day trips over time. Not all was well, though, by any means. People were still feeling the ramifications of the murder. That July, one of the first officers to respond to the scene, Ken Barker of the RCMP, ended his own life after a long battle with PTSD surrounding the incident. 
This once again riled up the public and reminded them of the weight of what exactly Vince had done, making this next bit sting even more. Starting in February 2015, Vince was given completely unsupervised day passes to leave the care center as long as he carried his cell phone with him and left it on. After that, he started going to group homes in the local community. Vince changed his name to Will Baker, likely in an attempt to move on from the incident, but this new identity was leaked very quickly. Later that month, the Criminal Code Review Board went over his case and decided to grant him the right to live on his own from then on out. The people were not happy. At the most, people were cautiously accepting of the idea. If the doctor, in their opinion, thinks that he's ready to go out into, you know, the public and the community, that I trust their judgment. I wouldn't want him living in my community, and plus he's going to be living in Winnipeg, I hear. That's unbelievable. However, a very good number of people were against the release altogether. Many people started collecting petitions to beg the review board to reverse their decision and put him back in at least some sort of supervised facility. Tim McLean's mother was also, understandably, very unhappy with the decision and spoke out at a rally in which people were petitioning Vince's full release. I can't express my appreciation enough to each and every one of you who have come out today, she said. I don't think that an individual who is as guilty as Vince Lee belongs back in our society free with no criminal record. I don't think that the system is any more prepared to deal with an individual as ill as Vince Lee than it was six years ago. We all know what happens when he doesn't take his meds, but the fact that that decision is left to him. However, it wasn't too long before the Manitoba Criminal Code Review Board granted Vince, or uh, rather Will, a complete discharge. He was absolutely free. There was to be no more restrictions, no more supervision, or any sort of legal obligations on his part. Many people, including Tim's mother, felt that a complete lack of any form of supervision left Will free to simply stop taking his medication whenever he wanted. On Facebook, she simply said, I have no comment today. I have no words. On the other hand, Will did have some people on his side, including Chris Somerville, the executive director of the Manitoba Schizophrenia Society, the guy who personally watched over his case and worked directly with him over the years. He is no longer a violent person, he asserted. I will say, yes, he absolutely understands that he has to take his medication and has a desire to live a responsible, moral life and never succumb to psychotic episodes and not to hurt anybody ever again. If he were to stop taking his medication, he's not going to become psychotic within an hour overnight because the medication stays in your bloodstream for so long, several weeks. Uh, we'll see. I mean, I'd like to have faith in the guy. I mean, people can be rehabilitated when it comes to mental illness. I mean, medication can work wonders, but I can see the other side too, very easily. I don't know, let me know what you think about it in the comments. I'm interested to see people's take on this one. I, I feel like this could be pretty divisive. So once again, thank you for watching my video. Uh, today's topic is one that I've kind of had on the back burner for a while. I've been wanting to talk about it for quite some time and I finally got around to it. So I hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, please give it a like. It helps out with the algorithm. Uh, comment what you think about it too. It's a pretty interesting one. If you like content like this, feel free to subscribe. I talk about this sort of stuff pretty much all the time. <laughs> and uh, if you want to support the channel even further, I do have a Patreon account, which I keep linked down in the description below. Speaking of which, shout out to the top patrons. So we've got Kevin E. Eid, AMCMT, Work in Progress USA, Tang, Sash Johnson, Marianne McCurdy, Buttery Frankus, Wafrans, Jules Latona, Arctic Cat, Alan Damiani, Adrian Lawley, Marsh, Buffazerk, Rinsenstein, Kim Peek, Lux Alpaca, Charity, Skooky Maine, Jackie, Tracer Ferguson, and Mark Barnett. You guys are all the best, probably ever. Thank you, and good night.